So our next talk, oh, this is, I'm very excited about this, Form 3. Sounds like a movie, doesn't it? Form 3. Do you have to have seen Form 1 and 2 to enjoy this talk? No, we're going to do a full recap, and you can't skip it like you can on Netflix. <laughs> what kind of film would it be if it was a film? Form 3. You know, the microservices are evolving and yeah, well, and taking over. Like a, it, it would certainly be like a Microsoft Office-based horror or something like that, wouldn't it? Form 3. <laughs> Return of the... You know, something. We'll workshop that later. Well, well this is yeah. Adelina. Adelina, welcome to GoForCon UK. Hello, everyone. Um, super excited to be here in person. And you, there's so many of you that I'm feeling a little bit like a rock star because I've also got the Britney microphone. Yeah. I just found out this was called a Britney microphone. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, without any further ado, please give it up for Adelina. Hey everyone, um, so welcome to my talk, Using NATS for Multi-Cloud Event Streaming. Let me introduce myself. My name is Adelina and I'm a technology evangelist at Form 3. I started at Form 3 in September, so I'm still quite new. I've been a gopher since 2018 and a back-end engineer since 2014. And I'm really, really excited that so many of you have come here today and have given me the opportunity to share some of the exciting work that we've been doing at Form 3. Now that you know who I am, let me introduce Form 3 as well. So it's not a movie. <clears throat> Our name is derived from third generation cloud technology and a shortened version of the world, uh, word platform, Form 3. We worked with some really great customers, some of which you can see on this slide, and they are tier one UK banks, and they choose our platform as their payment processing solution. We started in 2016, and we've been growing and scaling ever since. We currently have around 260 employees, about 130 of which are engineers, and we're fully remote and hiring. Today we will be learning about NATS, and NATS stands for Neural Autonomic Transport System. Derek Collison conceived NATS to be a messaging platform that functions as a central nervous system. And Derek is an industry veteran and pioneer that has a really long experience in designing and implemented large-scale distributed systems. He created NATS from the market need for simple, secure event streaming. It is open source and written in Go, and today we will be, see, be learning what it is, and we will see how we use it at Form 3. I'll introduce the Form 3 architecture, the fundamentals of NATS and Jetstream, and then we'll have a look at what we are actually doing with this amazing technology at Form 3. So we got a lot of ground to cover, and without further ado, let's start and look a little bit more at Form 3. So, so far we know that Form 3 is our name and payments is our game. But let's have a look at what this actually means. So, Form 3 sits between financial institutions, our customers, and the external payments infrastructure. We make our customers' lives easier because they integrate with our REST API, and then we take care of all the complexities of managing and securing payments. The payments that we take care of are fundamental to modern life. Think about paying your mortgage, getting your salary paid, transferring money to your friends. And I've shown you a couple of um, external payment schemes here, and their whole, their purpose is to define the standards of interbank transfers. In the UK, most payments are faster payments or FPS, and in the EU, most of them are SIPA. So now that we understand where Form 3 fits into the vast payments ecosystem, let's zoom in a little bit on our architecture. So the way it works is our customers send us a payment request, and then our payment services take that over and create the internal models representing the payment that you're wanting to place. At this point, we don't know 
for what scheme the payment is. So what we do is we use SNS and SQS fanout to send it out to the validation and gateway services. They are then in charge of securing and mapping all of the payments and send it on to the correct uh, payment scheme. What you also see is a little green box that shows that we have built our own physical data center from the ground up. And this is a private cloud that exposes some APIs that are similar to the public cloud provider. And the reason we had to build these physical data centers is due to regulatory constraints. So this is kind of like what we will be looking at today in our discussion with NATS, of NATS. And the architecture that I've shown you here has some really good pros. It's easy to add new schemes, and because it is a managed architecture, it's easy to scale, secure, and configure. However, AWS dictates our entire architecture, and SQS and SNS set the limit of our SLA. We have noticed that when our, when our platform is processing large volumes, we see a latency of 300 milliseconds plus, so this is the, we're seeing spikes. And this is only bound to get worse as we continue to process more and more payments on our infrastructure. Also, the SNS and SQS SLA of uptime is 99.9%. And this has real implications for a payments infrastructure such as ours, which is critical. So while, it will, while the SNS and SQS fan out was a really, really good place to start, to start, it was time for us to evolve our architecture. And we quickly identified NATS as a good candidate. It is designed for speed and it was lightweight to run. And this was important for us because we had to use NATS in our physical data centers. Also, the fact that it is open source and written in Go was a huge pro because we ourselves are a Go house. So let's have a look at exactly what NATS is as we enter this kind of discussion. The NATS fundamental concepts. So, so far we know that NATS is a messaging platform. And with NATS, you could build this kind of, kind of multi-cloud architecture where you can send messages regardless of the technologies that it, they originated from. At its core, core NATS is a fire and forget at most once messaging system. And what this means is that messages will arrive intact and in order from one publisher but no guarantees are given across publishers. Also, NATS will do its best to remain available, but if well, your subscriber is problematic or goes offline, then it will not receive messages. So this is what fire and forget means. NATS has three messaging patterns that we will be learning about today, which is pub, sub, or publish and subscribe, queue groups, and request and reply. And allowing for these messaging patterns makes NATS a versatile tool that we can use to solve a variety of problems in production. So let's have a quick run through of these messaging patterns. Publishers organize their messages into subjects which fundamentally represent an interest in data. What you see on this diagram is that I have a publisher publishing messages to payment.uk and then the two subscribers have subscribed to this subject by full specification and they each receive all the messages. We can compare this to SNS sending out all the messages to all of its subscribers. And you don't need to do a full specification of the subject that, you're, that you want to subscribe, you, subscribe to. You can also use wildcards, but I will show you this in a little bit. So PubSub allows us to just scale out exactly how many, all the messages to a variety of subscribers. So far, so good. Then you can have the queue groups. And 
in a Q group, you have multiple subscribers that are registered as belonging to that Q group, but each message will be delivered to only one subscriber chosen at random by NATS. So what you see here is that each subscriber one and subscriber two match the topic that we sent the messages to. So they'll each receive one message at random. But subscriber three joined the, the Q group, but its subject doesn't match, and therefore it doesn't receive messages. That makes sense, right? And Q groups are, we can compare Q groups to subscribers sharing an SQS queue. So you have these like two comparisons from what I've shown you before to what NATS can do. And Q groups are ideal for scaling services up and down and allowing NATS to take care of all the Q administration. Finally, we hit the request and reply pattern. And it looks a bit strange, but it uses the exact mechanisms that I've showed you before with the pub sub. So what happens is you will publish a message on a given subject, and then you will also specify a reply subject. And this, the reply subject is a special subject called inbox, which will redirect the reply back to the requestor. And this allows you to build acknowledges on top of your publishes. One of the cool things that you can do with request and reply is that finally you can start to step away from this fire and forget, I don't actually know if stuff was delivered. But of course, like you will have to, to do this manually. And I previously mentioned wildcards to you, so let's have a look at how they work. Not supports two wildcards. The star, which is sometimes called partial, matches one single token. And the greater than sign, which is sometimes called full, matches multiple tokens and must be at the end of the subject. And wildcards al allow us to build hierarchies in our subjects and are a huge selling point for NATS. So what you see on this diagram is that pub the publisher uh, publishes to payment.uk.new. And subscriber one receives the messages because the wildcard, the star wildcard token matches the UK. Subscriber two receives all the messages because it uses the full token and then it matches UK.new. And finally, subscriber three does not receive any messages because it uses the star partial token, but the publisher is actually sending two tokens, uk.new. So I hope this makes sense, and I will show you how I will demonstrate this to you in our, in our demos later as well. Okay, so I've taken you on like a very quick run through of the things we can do with core NATs, but let's have a look at a demo. So the NATs server is really simple to run uh, because this is one of the key philosophies of NATs. You can run it from Docker, Kubernetes, with a package manager, or from source. And today we'll, we will use it, we will run it using the NAT server command, and it will then expose you a URL for us to connect to. So I've prepared a little demo for you, and you can see it here in the NATS demo repo. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to start a NATS, we're going to look at some code, because it's GopherCon, so you need to see some Go code, right? I'm going to start the NAS server, we're going to connect a publisher, then we're going to connect some subscribers, and then we're going to see magic happen. Okay, so this is the code. And what you can see is I've created a small model payment, which it just contains like an amount and a currency, sender and receiver. You can see this on line 11. And then on line 23, I've created a get random payment method, which will just return, create this new random payment and then return a string, a string representation of it. So what we see here is the publisher. So what we use the flag package on line 17 to find the, um, the subject that we will be publishing to. 
And once we do that, on line 24, we connect to the NAT server. And we are using the NAT's client library, which you can see imported on line 10. If that all goes well, then we move on from the error handling. And on line 31, we start sending ra creating random payments and then publishing them to the NAT's connection. And we publish on bytes. Uh, we publish the bytes representation of the string. And we publish to the subject that we read from the flag package. So what you can see is that it's quite a small code snippet. And then we're going to just um, publish some random messages on this given subject. Now let's have a look at the magic of the subscriber. It also reads the subject online, um, or using the flag package on line 16. Then it connects to the, to the NAT server. I should have mentioned that the, the default URL that you see here is localhost port 4222. You can specify a different one, which I'll show you later how to do as well. And then it uh, calls subscribe and prints out whatever it receives. And if you're wondering what the runtime go exit does on line 36, it just kills the main go routine so that I don't have to block it. And it allows the subscriber go routine to run in the background. So that's all. I hope that you can really see how short these code snippets are. So let's have a look at it in action. OK. So I've promised you that we're going to start the NAT server, right? So all you do is NAT server, and then the minus the flag, minus D that I have there is just for debug, so we can see some of the output that it's using. So I start that, and you can see the server starts up on localhost 422. And that's really great, because that's what we expect to connect to. So now I'm going to run the publisher that I showed you, and it's going to, I'm passing it the payments.uk subject. So we're going to start creating payments. So it connects to the NAT server and then starts publishing these random payments that it's creating. I'm going to do the same thing underneath here, but I'll publish to a different subject, payments.pl. Let's say I've got UK payments and I've got some payments from Poland. So that starts as well, and it has its own counter. OK, finally, we need to see the subscribers in action. So we begin with, uh, with a subscriber that subscribes, subscribes to payments.uk. And once I start running that, it's listening, and you see that it's rece it starts receiving messages from 18 onwards. This is because Core NATS doesn't have any kind of message storage. All, all of the messages that we weren't listening out for have been dropped. And then in the second subscriber that I'm going to start, I'm using the wildcard. So I've done payments.start, which means that it will match one single token. So now this one starts receiving payments.pl and payments.uk as well, because the star will match both of the, of the topics, both, both of the subjects that I'm publishing to. So that's it. We're sending messages with NATs, and we're able to publish and subscribe to them. Um, I really hope that this has blown you away through its simplicity. So let's go back to our presentation, because our good work is not finished. I've demonstrated in the demo to you that NATS is really, really easy to use, and it, the developing with NATS is really simple. However, as we also saw in the demo, the at most once um, delivery model does have some drawbacks when it comes to message dropping. And it is likened to UDP, but it's not always enough, right? For a, a system like a platform like ours, where we cannot vanish transactions in thin air, we need a little bit more. So as a response to the need for persistence from the market, NAT streaming, or STAN, which is NAT backward, was introduced to trade off some of the performance of NAT for message persistence. 
And the way that it works is the streaming module, this, is, this diagram is from the Nats docs and they do a great, a great job of explaining it, is the streaming module is a sidecar to the Nats server and it communicates with the Nats server using Google protobuffers. And the streaming module is the one that's in charge of saving these messages and allowing us to replay them if we need to. And the NAT's client API, which you can see there, communicates with the NAT server, not directly with the streaming module. So this allows us to create um, a request and reply service on top of NATs, and it is, it is likened to TCP. So we went from UDP to TCP, and we now have some message delivery guarantees. But as we enter the realm of message persistence, we also need to talk about Jetstream. And Jetstream replaces NAT streaming, and it is designed to be a better streaming technology than we have today. It has all of the features um, that mature production systems need, such as at least once delivery, at rest encryption, and horizontal scalability. And unlike NAT streaming, where I showed you the sidecar, Jetstream is not um, an extra module to the NAT server. It is inbuilt into it. When you start entering the NAT's ecosystem, the difference between Jetstream and NAT streaming can be a little bit confusing because they seemingly do the same thing. It's all about message persistence, which is true. However, there are some key differences. In NAT streaming, clustering is only there to help with, to prevent data from like losses and faults. It is only the leader that is able to publish and subscribe messages. Jetstream does not have this limitation and it is horizontally scalable. In Jetstream, we have push and pull message consumption, which we will talk about shortly, while on the other hand, NAT streaming only has push message consumption. And pull message consumption can be really important because Jetstream is so quick that you might not want to consume messages at the rate that it delivers them. And finally, NAT streaming uses channels, which are FIFO queues that are internally managed that, con that contain protobuf messages, and they don't support wildcards. This is really unfortunate because wildcards were, were a big selling point of NATs. Therefore, if you're starting out to, with NATs and you're looking for message persistence, you should use Jetstream as is recommended by the folks at NATs. Okay, so we understand some differences and there is, you, there is an understanding of the need for message persistence. So let's have a look at exactly what Jetstream is. So we, as exactly like we did before with NATS, let's go through some of the fundamentals of Jetstream. And one of the fundamental concepts of Jetstream is the stream, which defines message, retention, message storage and retention, and it consumes normal NATS subjects. Once you start the Jetstream server, you're not committed to running um, only persistent messages. So you could create stuff like uh, what you see up here with notification as a regular NAT subject, and it doesn't belong to a stream, while payments can belong to a stream and you have retention and reliability. And this kind of stuff is, is really important because like, they're not all models are born equal, so I might not care as much about notifications as I care about payments. Publishers can do a normal publish or a request a reply publish, and you will receive an acknowledge once your message is successfully published. Um, and what you see here is that the NAT stream um, is defined as payment.star, and now both the subjects are abiding by the same stream retention policies. So I hope that makes sense so far. Streams behave like normal subjects. And the final um, concept of Jetstream is consumers that can either be pull or push based. And push based consumers will allow Jetstream to deliver messages as fast as it possibly can to a given subject, such as you he see here with the push consumer. 
and the poll consumer allows you to batch your messages if you wanted to and to read messages at a rate that you want. Now, there is no dead letter queue like you might have in other systems, but you, there is a maximum delivery attempt that you can configure to stop messages from poisoning your system. Once they start, consumer will take a start position, either by default, which is the beginning, or you can specify one. And finally, they can be either durable or ephemeral, and durable consumers can continue consuming from where they left off once they shut down, or they can be ephemeral where you can, you'll start consuming from the beginning, but you can always specify a start position either by time or sequence. And if you don't use if you don't use a, if you don't set up a stream, natural, you'll, you'll only be able to create a push consumer since there's no storage in Nat's core. Yeah, I don't know what's happening. <laughs> okay, so now we got the fundamentals down, we're done with the theory, done and dusted, close that book, throw it away, right? Let's have a look at another demo and then see if the code gets more complicated once we actually have persistence in place. There is no Jetstream server. As I said, Jetstream is inbuilt into the NAT server. And all you need to do is just to enable it. And you can do that with, if you're running from the, from the command line like we will, well, you can do that with slash JS, or you can pass it a configuration file. And we'll be using a configuration file, and I'll show you all about that. And we'll do the exact same drill as we did before, where we're gonna start the NAT server, we're gonna start a publisher, and then we're gonna connect some subscribers and see some more magic happen. Okay, I promised you a configuration file, and it is magical. Well, well it's magical because it's really small. So what you see is that Jetstream, um, I create a store directory, by default, the store directory, which means the place where we'll be storing the persisted messages, is slash temp, but you can define a different one. And I set a max memory and a max file store. And now I define a different port because we remember that the other NAT server that I had started is running on port 442, 4222. And you might be wondering why is the port hanging out by itself, not inside Jetstream, but that's because the port is configured on the NAT server, not on actual Jetstream. And now we've got a publisher, right? So I create, I set, I set up a constant on line 19 for the port. And this time I've removed all of that like flag stuff because I only want to set up, I want, only want to publish to the, um, particular stream that I'll be setting up. So we connect to the Jetstream URL on, on line 26, and if that goes fine, then we create a Jetstream context. So the only difference from the code that you saw before is now that we'll, we'll be interacting with Jetstream, not with the NATS connection anymore. And then on line 38, I add a stream to Jetstream, and in it I put um, the the name of the subject that I pr declared further up with a star next to it. So we're all of the, um, so the name of the subject is defined up here as uh, on line 16 as payments, no, as, uh, line 15 on payments, and then the name of the subject that we'll be publishing to is payments.uk. Then on the cleanup, I defer a cleanup function that deletes the stream. Um, and the reason we do that is because if I start a publisher and the NAT server continues to run, then the stream will, keep, will also continue to exist. And then if I try to start another publisher, then it, we won't be able to create the same stream twice. And obviously you can't do this in production, but you can configure it, uh, you can configure your server. But for this demo, I've only, um, I've done it here in the publisher. And then we do the exact same thing that we did before. From line 56 on, we just publish random payments. And that's it for the publisher. As you can see, some changes 
we did have to make some changes because we had to start interacting with the Jetstream context, but otherwise the code doesn't get more overly complicated than before. And then I created a push consumer, and it's exactly the same thing as we did before, where I subscribe, uh, well, I connect to the NATS, uh, to the NATS server on line 24, and then I create a, the Jetstream context on line 31, and then I subscribe. So this is all the same as before. We will be doing unacknowledged uh, subscribes because, like, I don't want to get start complicating the code for this demo. And then. I've also made a pull consumer, and it also it, it does the same thing as before, but we connect to the NATS uh, to the NATS server, and then we create the Jetstream context, and then we use the pull subscribe for, um, and then that monitor hard coded thing that you see there, on line 37, is just saying that I want to consume without acknowledgement. And then we have a for loop that continuously fetches three messages at a time. And that's your pull consumer. So that's also pretty simple and easy to use. So let's have a look at all of this in action. These guys are still happily running. Um, OK. So I say I start the NAT server, and then it says minus C that I want to use a, a configuration file, and then the minus D for debug like we did before. So let's start it up. And you can see here it's like snazzy. It says Jetstream. Uh, but then what we see is the store directory has been configured exactly like I said in the JS demo. Oops, sorry. Um, and we start the, we are listening for co client connections on port 5. Two, 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 two. There's too many twos there. Okay, now I'm going to start the publisher. And it connects and starts sending payments to payments.uk. And this is like exactly what we've seen before, nothing fancy. But we can have a look here and we can see that there's a client connection created. And then we also have a ping timer. So Jetstream uses uh, persistent connections to make sure that you. Um, that a connection between the publisher is kept alive. And then finally, we've got the push consumer, and as soon as I start it, it gets caught up with all the messages that we needed up until now. If it were NAT's core, all of this stuff would be dropped. Um, and then it continues listening, um, it continues receiving messages one by one. And then let's have a look at the pull consumer. So this one gets caught up in batches of three, so one by one. And then I don't know if we'll wait for it. OK, we can wait for it. But once it catches up, it won't respect the batch size anymore because NatStream will start like sending you the messages uh, one by one. And I think you're already starting to see that there. So you see 34, 34 and 35. So that's it. That's Jetstream in action. Again, we saw two very small code snippets. So now, really, you've seen everything you need to get started with NATS, really. And it's time to see what we're doing with this technology at Form 3. So the first place we implemented NATS was in our physical data centers, and we did that in March 2020 as our event bus. And we've been delivering a more than more than a million messages every day uh, using just NAT streaming in our in our physical data centers. And because of this success, we started looking at uh, implementing NATs and this time Jetstream because time passed and Jetstream was made available elsewhere in our platform. And, and the SQS and SNS fan out pattern fit the bill perfectly. So we then replaced all of this, and um, our validation and gateway services can use pull consumers to make sure that we scale at a rate that we're comfortable with. Now, what we can imagine is that you, we've got NATS Jetstream running in one cluster, and then NATS streaming in a different cluster, and we're bridging these together using something called leaf nodes, which is another great mechanism that um, NATS provides. 
And while I did say that not streaming is deprecated and it's been replaced, it's still being maintained until 2023. So we've got some time until we need to upgrade to Jetstream. And I didn't show you all of the different configurations that you can have in um, NAT streaming and Jetstream. But one of the really cool things that I wanted to highlight to you is that Jetstream supports message deduplication in a sliding window, which is by default two minutes. And it allows us to discard duplicate messages directly on the stream, saving us from delivering the messages and then doing database checks on it. This is a really, really cool feature that I think was worth highlighting. And I mentioned clustering um, a couple of times already. Unfortunately, like this, I don't have time to go too much into detail here, but it supports out-of-the-box clustering. And the way that it works is that servers connect together into a cluster, and then they expose one single cluster URL, which we can, we can connect to. And we need a quorum um, to be able to support, to make sure that we don't have any data losses. And NATS recommend between three and five Jetstream-enabled servers to be able to make sure that we don't have, we have enough fault tolerance. Um, yeah, and the, the gossiping is how the servers make a mesh, and then they can like heal and, um, you know, shrink and grow. Okay, and I know I've like droned on and on for a long time, but we finally made it to the end, and it's time to draw some conclusions. We did find um, at Form 3 that NATS delivered um, on its promise of simplicity and ease of configuration. And the client library was easy to use and our engineers enjoy using NATS. But most importantly, it unlocks the ability to migrate our platform to cloud agnostic technologies. And what I showed you here today is not the end state of our platform. We're actually building a true multi-cloud architecture, which would not be possible without the power of Jetstream, which was also on my slide. And I know that it's important to kind of follow the metrics, but it's really difficult to do the comparison between SQS and NATS because it's a completely different me uh, delivery paradigm. And we did find that SQS delivery ranges in between 50 and 500 milliseconds. And NATS is very quick, but that's also because the servers are close to each other geographically. So I don't have like a full metric backup that I can show you. All I can say is that it definitely gave us the performance improvements in our platform. And finally, this is my last slide, I promise. Um, why, you might still be wondering why we didn't go for the battle-tested Kafka. And Kafka, yes, Kafka is amazing and lots of people really use it. And it is battle tested, but then so is NATS. And lots of people, lots of really cool companies such as like Cloud Foundry, uh, VMware, and Siemens are already using it at amazing scale. But most importantly, we needed a lightweight solution in our data centers. And NATS is definitely more lightweight because Kafka has the JVM, right? And also, as I hope I've shown you today, there's a lot more flexibility in the consumption patterns that you can build with NATS, um, and this will give us a lot more possibility to extend to whatever we want to do in the future. So with that, I thank you all for listening. Please come and visit the Form 3 booth, and there's a lot of other people you can talk to if you're sick of my voice, which I totally understand. Thank you very much. Oh, brilliant. Okay, so do we have any questions then for Adelina? Does that need to be switched on? Thank you. Do, uh, do we have any questions for Adelina? Let's see hands. Yes. And the microphone apparently has to be switched on, which is weird. Strange feature. Who put their hand up? Sorry. Didn't pay any attention. There you go. You have to come and get it, mate. Meet me halfway. 
Um, I want to know a little bit more about message de de duplication uh, in NATS and how that works when you're considering things like message replay. So when it comes to deduplication, it gets dropped immediately in the window. So when you replay, it won't be there. Right. So and you said it's by default two minutes. Yeah, and you can change it to whatever you want. What I was asking is, if you consider things like message replay, for example, how does that interact with if you have a failure in the system and you're trying to replay an event that already occurred? So I don't fully know because that's not like super well described in the docs, but I do imagine that, let's say you're reading before the deduplication takes place, you might still have some um, message, some duplicate messages and you might need to take care of that in your code. Something like that. Well, we can look into it if you want. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Yep. Here we go. I haven't really been exercising through lockdown, so I'm just gonna walk. Get them steps in. Yeah, I forgot my Apple Watch as well, so this exercise is a complete waste. <laughs> okay, sorry, who had the hands up? Hello, uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I have a question about stream. Uh, how do you create it? Like uh, lazy creation? You like need new stream, you run service and like you check if it's created, if not, you create it. Or you'll just, I don't know, create it in cluster or command line. Yeah, so I'll, I can show you in the docs as well how you can do it. But when you set up your server, you can create it with CRDs. Um, and then it'll just be created on the startup. And remember that like streams actually exist on the node level. So once you start up your node, then you can de declare them. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. And another one here? Yeah. Hiya, uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I hope you liked it. <laughs> it was very good actually, very well structured. I wanted to know uh, how is the observability around Nats and Jetstream? Is there good support for third parties or you had to build a lot of custom stuff? So I know that it integrates with Prometheus and Grafana, but I haven't myself played with it. Um, as far as I know, they expose a port that you can monitor on. Okay. Do we have another question? Yes, we do. Oh. <laughs> have you done any um, comparison in terms of costs between SQS and NATS? I actually don't know how to answer this. Um, I haven't looked into it, but we've got a lot of engineers who will answer this for you later. You answer it by saying no. <laughs> Hi, hello. Thanks a lot for the talk. Um, I guess I can check that later, but like, did you need to like, do some join between streams like Kafka? Like it is possible in Kafka, right? Like you can join streams and then you can combine them, you can produce new stuff. It, it is so cool. It's, I'm happy I got this question. So you can actually set up something called a source stream and a mirror stream. So let's say that I've got a stream that's only got a short message retention, but then I want to put it together in another like a replicated stream in an audit that's saved somewhere different. You can definitely do that. And when you define that, then NAS takes care of all this kind of stuff for you. Cool. Thank I you. was actually thinking to put that in the slides, but I thought maybe too much. <laughs> Brilliant. Oh, I think we've got time for one more question, if there is one. No. Well, Adelina, thank you so much. Adelina, everyone. <laughs>